Hi everyone and welcome to Church Online. My name is Abby and I'm the new student and young adult pastor here at Coburg Alliance Church in Coburg, Ontario. We are so glad you are joining us this morning. If you are new to Church Online, you'll see to the right of your screen or just below if you are on a mobile device, some tools to help you enjoy this experience. You are going to see a chat button where you can interact with others. You can take a look at our schedule and even follow along with the Bible. At the top of the screen, you'll see a connect and give button. And at the bottom of the screen, there's a button that says request prayer. If there's anything we can do for you or pray for, tap the button. We would love to pray for you.
Welcome back everybody. If you are new with us today, we want you to know that no matter where you are coming to us from, we love that you're here and we'd love to get to know you. One of the best ways you can connect with us is through our connection card. Open a tab or click the link in the chat window and let us know that you are here. We'd love to reach out, say hello and get to know you. We've been talking about joining the mission all month. And one of the best ways to get reconnected is to get connected to one of our teams. Some of you have already reached out to find out how you can get involved in the guest experience and kids ministry teams. And this week we wanna dig into why serving in student ministry is a great next step. First reason is that there is a need to serve the next generation. I love this next generation. I love their energy and their ideas. Our youth are so important and we want to serve them in the best way possible. We need people like you to pour out your wisdom and be a close friend to our youth. Reason number two, our students need Jesus. In a time of life where there is so much growth and a lot of decisions that have to be made, having a solid foundation in God is essential. This time of life can help to set them up for whatever life may bring them, and you get to be a part of bringing the love of God to them. And reason number three, you will be able to see the results of your hard work. When you take time to invest in youth, you are able to spend and see how much time, the, the time that you've spent with them can make such a significant impact in their life. If you are interested in getting involved in student ministry, send me a message at abby at coburgalliance.ca and I'd love to chat with you. And speaking of youth, there are a couple things for you to be aware of. Next week, we are having Riot, and that will be taking place on Tuesday night from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Check out our website and social media pages for more info. And we are also gonna be launching a couple big youth events over the rest of the summer. We are super excited to be hanging out with you all and be able to actually do some really fun activities. Keep listening to the announcements and checking our website for more details. And finally, we want to remind everyone that applications for the Fall Canada Jobs positions are due by July 30th. If you are between the ages of 16 and 30 years and are interested in digital ministry or kids and youth ministry, we would love to hear from you. You can find more information on our website. That's it for me. Let's continue in our worship. Lord of all, so 
My name is Paul. I'm so grateful that we can gather together today, whether that's in person or online. Uh, for Jesus said that whenever two or three are gathered in his name, that he is there with us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your presence, for the presence of the Holy Spirit among us today. I pray that we will be refreshed and renewed uh, by your word that is shared with us today. I pray that the Holy Spirit reaches out to us in our time together and convicts us in you. Lord, help us in our, in our human frailty and weakness so that we can serve you, always striving to further your kingdom here on earth. Help us to recognize and use whatever gifts that you have given us. Father, we are the instruments of your plan on earth. We know this. It is up to us to spread the good news of the gospel. I ask that, uh, that we are all able to play our part, however big or small, in helping to establish your kingdom here on earth. Strengthen our faith so that we are equipped to bring about change for the better in the lives that we encounter daily. As restrictions begin to lift, we continue to pray for everybody in our community and around the country who keep us all safe and healthy day by day. Lord, we pray for those that have been impacted by the COVID virus in, in one form or another, whether um, they have become ill or lost loved ones. Lord, we just pray that, um, that you will be with them, that you will uh, send the Holy Spirit to comfort them and remind them that they are not alone, that, that you do not leave them, and give them strength and courage to continue. Lord, in all of these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Coburg Alliance. Uh, it's me again. Uh, hello. Sorry, welcome, good to see you. Uh, we're going to continue our series on the book of James, and this morning we're going to be looking at James chapter 3, verse 1 to 12. So remember, as I spoke last time to you, James is always interested. He's, va he's absolutely fascinated with the process of salvation, right? So one of the things we kind of forget about Christianity is that, again, it's not a one and done. It's not a statement that we make. It, that can be the starter. That can be the catalyst. But whatever point in time that we decide to make the tipping point of our faith, from that day forward till the day that we die, we are in constant transformation for what God wants, the things he wants. 
So this morning, we're going to kind of continue on, and James is going to look at another aspect of our lives in regards to what our faith looks like. But before we begin, I just want to give you some context to this passage, right? So obviously this morning, we're going to talk about the tongue, right, which gets us all in a lot of, a lot of trouble. But just remember, this is a continuing theme with James, and he's showed us already a little bit about it. So take a look in James chapter 1, verse 19. It says this, my, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Look at chapter 1, verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. So as we talk about the tongue this morning, this is an ongoing topic for James. Uh, Warren uh, Wearsby says this about this passage. James has explained uh, to us two characteristics of the mature Christian. He is patient in trouble, James chapter 1, and he practices the truth, James chapter 2. In this section, he shares the third characteristic of a, characteristic of a mature believer. He has power over his tongue. Now remember, the letter of James is to the dispersed Jewish believers across the Roman Empire. So dispersed Christians living in the Roman Empire should be careful about what they communicate because it has wide implications as to whom they represent. And again, John MacArthur says this about this idea of, of the tongue. What you are will inevitably be disclosed by what you say. It might be said that a person's speech is a reliable measure of his spiritual temperature, a monitor of the inner human condition. The rabbis spoke of the tongue as an arrow rather than a dagger or a, dagger or a sword because it can wound or kill from a great distance. It can, it can wreak great damage even when far from its victim. So this morning, we're going to take a look at what James is going to be talking about in regards to the tongue. But again, remember... There are deep implications of what James is trying to convey, and so hopefully we'll wrestle with that. And again, we're going to go through verse by verse, and we're going to unpack that. But with this one as well, too, I'm going to have to give it a bit of a postmodern twist as well, too, because how James is addressing it in the ancient world actually has different implications in our postmodern world. But let's just dive in and open your Bibles to James chapter 3, and we're going to go to uh, verses uh, 1 and 2. So verses 1 and 2 says this, and by the way, I did mention this last time, I always use the NLT version, so if you're following along, uh, I'm using the NLT just as a little heads up. So uh, James chapter 3, verses 1 to 2 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Now, like this is this this verse by the way, just so you know, that when I was thinking about becoming a pastor, when I was thinking about getting into ministry, it was this verse that kind of made me go, mm. I, I just I have a confession for you. Um I have a tendency to be very sarcastic and perhaps had very sharp wit. Now I don't know, well actually I do know the reasons why, you know, I I'm not the most gigantic of a person. So I didn't use my physical prowess when I was young. Remember, I have five older sisters, right? So I'm the sixth, right? And so my five older sisters and just, just all of that, I just, I just kind of, my, my, my mouth was my best weapon. So I was always had the ability to make fun of somebody or be sarcastic. So when I read this passage in James chapter three and I felt God's calling in my life, it says this, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. And I'm like, oh, okay, I, then that's it. I can't be a pastor. And the good news is God can take this and transform it. But the reality is there are deep implications to this and we can't escape it. Now, what James is saying here is speech as truth, right? Now, it's only appropriate that James starts with the biggest mouths in the church, right? And doctrinal accuracy counts as much as venom spewed to others. And this is why James starts off with teachers. Now, remember, if you are a new believer, a, a Jewish person who's embraced, embraced Jesus as the Messiah, and now you're scattered throughout the Roman Empire, you are the first missionary to whatever village, town, city you live in. And so you go there and you start talking about Jesus, right? What James is trying to make sure is that as you are teaching about Jesus, make sure your ego, make sure your own interpretation doesn't get in the way of who Jesus is. So when James starts talking about speech, when he starts talking about the tongue, it's of course absolutely appropriate that he starts off with doctrinal accuracy. Now let's go to verses three to five. 
Uh, we can make a large ho horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. I love that idea of grand speeches. So this next part shows us, so the first part was speech is truth. The second part is speech as direction, right? The metaphors of bridle and rudder implicates direction. When we communicate, we are charting a future. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about that, right? So we, oftentimes we think about speech, uh, we think of it in maybe disconnected ways with what's going on on the inside, right? Now, remember, James chapter 2, when I was talking about it, was all this about all this idea about, you know, uh, belief and behavior, right? So making sure they're not disconnected. Well, sometimes our speech can be, we can think it's disconnected from who we are, but the fact is it's not. I love what Ambrose Beer says. She, uh, they say this, speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and that's absolutely true. So what James is trying to make sure that these new believers, as they go into the Roman Empire, right, understand something, right? How, what you say will direct the course of your life. Which, again, I don't know if we really think about the implications of that, uh, but I think that we should absolutely think about the implications of that today, and we'll get to that. Now let's go to verses uh, 5 to 6. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it itself is set on, <laughs> set on fire by... <laughs> so I don't mean to laugh here, but you, know, you get James's drama here, right? Let, let me just repeat that, right? It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Remember, James has this way of trying to overemphasize, to overcorrect, so that we don't miss out on what he's saying, right? What we say, how we interact with people, if we don't watch ourselves, we can allow so many different things to kind of pollute that and, and, and all of a sudden change that in a way that can be destructive to us. But you know, when I was reading this, something kind of caught my attention because James uses this idea of the tongue is a flame of fire. And you know, when you read the Bible or you read something, there's something in the back of your mind like, wait a minute, I've heard that somewhere before. And then I had the aha moment. So I went to Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and, 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 and verse 11. And look what the, Acts chapter 2 says. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire, see the similarity there, appeared and settled on each of them. We all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. You know, I think it's interesting that maybe James, who was there in the upper room, the Bible tells us James was there in the upper room, that it's only appropriate that James sees the Holy Spirit, this tongue of fire that came to visit people in the upper room, and still today when we make a confession of Jesus, right, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I feel like James is making the parallel that really the only, only the Holy Spirit, only the creative force of the universe has the ability to be able to take our tongues and the way we communicate and kind of hold them very closely and make sure they're, uh, they're not getting away from us. Uh, Sandra Pulaski has a great uh, insight into this passage. She says this, the third metaphor develops in a distinctly different direction than the first two. After all, the bit and the rudder are simply tools. In James' view, however, there's a sense in which the tongue is not simply a tool to be utilized, but an agent independent of its possessor. The metaphor of the igniting flame, like those of a bit and rudder, deals with small entities with large effects. Right? And this is what's interesting, right? Is that what James is saying is your tongue can say something, and again, it can be an offhand comment, remark, uh, sarcasm, whatever it might be. But without realizing, we can seriously hurt and damage people in ways that we don't even realize. Right? Again, you can say, well, it's just, it was just an offhanded thing or it was just a small thing. And that may be true. But the fact is that James is trying to convey to us that this actually has deep implications to other people's lives, but also the lives of us as well, too. Now, let me just pause here for a second, because so far we've been talking about the tongue in speech. But the reality is, is what James was doing is he, he was using, in the ancient world, the most predominant way of communicating. Well, as I said to you at the beginning of the, our time together, that I wanted to kind of take this passage of scripture and thrust it into the postmodern world. 
The tongue was the ancient world's view of communication, but in today's culture, we, we communicate in a myriad of ways. James is showing how speech needs wisdom. For our context, we need to be aware that speech has gone past the voice into the digital realm. See, it's not enough to say to ourselves that what we say, and of course what we say is, can be damaging, but really our digital lives is what we say as well. Um, I came across this great article about a woman named Justine Sacco. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. This happened a couple of years ago. But uh, John Ronson uh, wrote an article about her in the New York Times. So you know it's a, uh, a pretty big event. So the article was this. How one stupid tweet blew up Justine Sacco's life. So Justine Sacco was a marketing uh, representative and she was flying from the United States to, uh, to Africa. And it's an, it's an 11 hour flight and so she tweets something and it was an off-handed comment, not smart, not wise, not defending the tweet. And again, you can go look up what it is, but it was just a tweet and she was trying to be, uh, I don't know what, but she, she, gets the, she, she makes this tweet and of course you get on the plane, you turn your phone off and it's an 11-hour flight. Now, look what John Ronson says in his article. Sacco boarded the plane. It was an 11-hour flight. So she slept. When the plane landed in Cape Town, South Africa, and was taxiing on the runway, she turned on her phone. Right away, she got a text from someone she hadn't spoken to since high school. And the text is this. I'm so sorry to see what's happening. Sacco looked at it baffled. The article goes on to say this. By the time Sacco had touched down, Tens of thousands of angry tweets have been sent in response to her joke. Hannah, meanwhile, frantically deleted her friend's tweet and her account. Sacco didn't want to look, but it was far too late. Sorry, at Justine Sacco will run uh, Twitter user. Your tweet lives on forever. So what happens is when Justine Sacco leaves from uh, America, um, ends up in Cape Town, within a matter of weeks, she loses her job. She's ostracized from her, her friends and her family. She hides and she stays over in Africa. Her life is ruined. It's, it's absolutely ruined. And, and uh, John Ronson actually meets with her and talks a couple of years later after this and saying, like, like, what happened and how did you go? But her life was completely destroyed because of, again, a not a smart tweet for sure. But it's something that she said in an offhanded way, but the implications, and she says this in her interview, it destroyed her life. She lost her job, she, she, friends unfriended her, and people, complete strangers, began attacking her because of this. So what's interesting is, is that when we understand this idea about speech, what we have to realize is in the world that we live in today, speech isn't just what we say anymore. Speech is what we type, what we tweet, what we put on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and on all the other platforms that are out there, Reddit, right? Like, like speech has absolutely different consequences. Um, as of 2019, there are 3.2 billion social media users all around the world, which is about 42% of the Earth's population. Just so you know, I'm sure the other 50% are way happier, but that's a different conversation. Um, in addition, there are roughly 4.5 billion internet use, uh, uses across the world today. These statistics are proof of the growing dominance of digital media in our lives. So what's interesting is, as we as Christ followers have to think about what we say, not just again to people face to face, but what we say in the digital realm, which has vast implications in the world that we are living in. Uh, Dr. Charles Taylor calls our age the age of authenticity. To be authentic is the final word in credibility. We must be true to ourselves. But I would say that we communicate Jesus in a whole host of ways, right? We have to understand that James is trying to coach and help and come alongside these new messianic Jewish believers and trying to help them to understand as they're going out into the Roman world, as they're going out into the world, make sure that your, your speech aligns itself with what you can proclaim about who you are. But I would say that as, as much of a danger as speech was to the early church, speech and speech in the digital realm are digital avatars well, they have huge implications as well, too. Uh, Tim Art wrote a great article about Christians and social media. He says this, 
What you do and say on social media actually matters. While many Christians carry themselves with kindness and grace at church, once they tap that social media app, they transform into some kind of snarling beast. Christians are called to be Christ's ambassadors, but for some reason on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, many times it seems like Christ is completely absent from our minds. What Tim is saying, and I think this is something Christians really need to understand something, is that what we, how we portray ourselves in the digital realm is not disconnected with who we are, right? Um, over the last year and a half of the pandemic, and again, please forgive me for keep bringing this up, Christians have, how do I say this nicely? We have caught our, uh, been caught up in different controversies, uh, different uh, conspiracies, different viewpoints. Now, please understand, I am of the mindset that we should live, act out however we think we should. But because I'm a Christ follower, I always am aware that what I say and do has implications to those around me. So on Facebook, um, I have friends from high school who follow me. Now, just so you know, my Facebook profile is so boring. I'm not sure I've posted on it in a couple of years because I don't, I don't really care about Facebook. But whenever I like or say something, I'm, I'm always aware that I know that people who know that I'm a pastor, but apart from even that, that I'm a Christian. So whatever I say and do, whatever I share, I'm aware that they're looking at it. Likewise, on Instagram as well, too, I make sure that whatever I post is, is not something that's going to portray Jesus in a certain way. I'm not on Twitter, so, you know, Twitter's where trolls live, so I don't really care about Twitter. But, and that's pretty much my social media uh, presence. But I have become more and more aware that people just will look for reasons to be offended or take things out of context or just start arguments. And so as a pastor, I've tried to teach my church and try to, you know, as I've navigated through this pandemic as well, too, I've tried to do it in such a way that I, I don't want to portray Jesus in such a way that Jesus gets aligned with my politics, Jesus gets aligned with my opinions, or Jesus gets aligned with conspiracies, right? Or, or, or controversies or whatever, right, right? Whoever Jesus is, he is transcended to these things in my life. And so how I portray myself, what I say, what I do, I know that there are people watching me. As a youth pastor, I always thought it was so funny that, you know, um, my youth who, again, I don't, I, perhaps not the brightest, I, I, I don't know, you know, you could argue that youth are what they are, but they would go out and they would post things on Twitter and Instagram or Facebook. And if they were my friends, not the Twitter, but Instagram or Facebook, I would see it. Right, so if they're getting drunk or acting inappropriately, then they would come to youth and they would worship, whatever. I'd be like, just so you know, that thing that you said about somebody else or that thing you were, you know, or I saw that. And so what we've done is we've created these digital um, personalities that seem to not be connected to our real life personalities. And so what Tim Arnott is saying is that as Christians, we have to realize that what we say, again, not just speech, as James is saying, but what we do and how we live in the digital realm, it has implications. And this is not to say that we as Christians just take whatever the government or so our media or whatever and just go, okay. But it is to say that whatever we believe and say, that we just have to betray it in a way that is gracious, in a way that is, that is um, not going to... Uh, stir up and distract from Jesus, right? And so as James is saying things about the tongue and, he, and he's given a couple metaphors, and I'll review them at the end here, we just have to make sure that we apply that to our digital selves as well too, so that we don't disconnect how we betray ourselves. Like it is astounding to me that Christians will attack other people or other Christians online without thinking to themselves, people are watching this. People are aware of this, right? It's like <clears throat> you realize that this is, this, is, this is not really helping the cause of who Jesus is. And so I just think that we need to make sure <clears throat> that we take the principle that James is talking about, about the tongue, and we take that and we apply that to our digital tongues. A weird idea, but you get the idea, right? Our digital selves cannot be disconnected by our true selves. And likewise, Whoever we are and whatever we believe about Jesus, whatever we believe about faith, well, in the digital realm, we have to make sure that we are not um, 
you're discrediting, bringing dishonor to the cause of Jesus, to the cause of Christ, by how we act and behave towards other people. And so just make sure you're that's in the back of your mind, that don't get so focused on, on the speech aspect, of it, which of course is important, but realize that speech in our today's context, in our postmodern world, is vastly different and how we communicate and what we say about things is, is, is vastly different. Now let's go on here. Verse seven to 10 says this, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Now, I love the fact that I just said that Tim Arndt calls Christians snarling beasts online. And, and James himself says that, you know, we can tame beasts. It's the human beast that we can't seem to tame, right? And, and look what James says here, right? Praising God and cursing others shows the disconnect of our faith. Remember, we've already talked about this in chapter two, right? What does James say, right? Belief and behavior cannot be disconnected. And what's he saying here, right? who we are, and also how we portray ourselves in speech and in the digital realm cannot be disconnected, right? We have to be aware that we need to use so much more wisdom and absolutely discernment on how we portray ourselves and what we think about ourselves and how we are, are talking about ourselves in this world. Um, I don't know, I probably shouldn't even bring out this example, but I'm going to. So there's this person I'm friends with on Facebook, and you know, they are constantly posting, you know, pictures of Jesus and and um, pictures of uh, our links to church services and all that. And again, that's 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 great, that's that's fine. But lately, they've become quite angry and they're attacking government and government, and not even government, not, not even the Canadian government, like I'm the American one. Like, like I always say to people, like. Just so you know, we won the War of eighteen twelve. We, you know, we're not, we're not Americans, right? But like, like they had just, they just lost their mind, and they were just spewing venom and conspiracy and all this stuff, right? And then post, you know, Jesus loves you, you know, pictures. So I just, I private messaged them, and I just said, hey, just so you know, there's, uh, you're, you're having a bit of digital whiplash online here. So on the one hand, you're saying how much Jesus loves us and that people should go to church and worship videos. On the other hand, you're, 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 you're talking, you're saying these things that just seem so ugly in regards to our Christianity. And I, and I, just, I just wanted to, in kindness, and I, was, I, I, I read this, 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 this message over and over and over again, um, just to make sure that I, w I wasn't, that wasn't going to be uh, construed as something kind of negative, but I just wanted her to understand. I just wanted them to understand that, you know, you just, you can't, you know, you can't, <laughs> you, you can't praise God with one hand and curse those who are made in the image of God and the other. There is a disconnect and the world sees it, right? And the world sees it. Now let's go on to verse 11 and 12. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, you can't draw fresh water from salty spring. So let's go back here now and let's take a look at the process, right? So on the screen, I'm going to bring up to, uh, you know, all the metaphors that James has gone for, right? So teachers in the church, bit and rudder, spark and fire, poison, spring and fruit, uh, spring and fig, sorry. So what James has done, again, as James is always concerned about the process, embedded in almost everything James talks about is process, right? So he goes outward to inward, right? Outward, teachers in the church, right? Inward, what are we, what are we producing, right? Again, fruit, right? The, 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 the behavior being aligned with the belief, right? And so James starts off with, you know, you know make sure that you teachers in the church that you are, are doing this. And again, Pastors, we absolutely have to be aware of how we are portraying ourselves online, what we're saying, of course, right? But it's not just about online as well, too. It's about doctrine, it's about theology to make sure that what we are saying is in alignment with the Bible as opposed to in alignment with the culture, for sure, right? But then James goes piece by piece, and he begins to kind of uh, dismantle all the arguments that we might say to push back against James, right? So we'll say, well, James, or well, James like, no, no, okay, make sure you understand that, right? You know, teachers in the church, right? Speech as direction. What you say, how you portray yourselves will chart the trajectory of your life. Spark and fire. Remember, 
that a small comment, a small thing online, you know, small tweet, these have, you know, vast implications just as Justine Sacco. But then it gets this idea of poison, right? And again, I love this, I, I love the metaphor that he uses because again, nobody thinks poison is a good thing, but we spew it out, we, we spill it out like, 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 like we think there's no effect to it. But then again, the end result is James asks the very simple question, what are we producing, right? Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives, right? So he's saying that what we are producing, right? What we are doing, and again, what we are behaving cannot be disconnected with what Jesus is doing within us as well, right? So again, please hear me. James' is, his letter is absolutely about, you know, about teaching Jewish believers how to behave. But what he's also saying as well, too, is just make sure in your behavior, what you do, but also how you portray yourselves, what you say, this has implications with Jesus. Now, I think what we're really seeing here, and this is what we need to understand, is communication as revelation. Because throughout what James has been saying is what we say is going to reveal what we really are. Right? And again, that is absolutely horrifying to think about, right? That when people portray themselves online, when people talk about themselves online uh, or in speech, right? We, we are really portraying ourselves, but we are really revealing ourselves to the world. And what we're revealing perhaps can be a disconnect by what we believe, by what we are behaving. Austin Jones says it this way, and this was a tweet that I thought this was kind of funny. Um, again, I don't have Twitter, so I, I, I pulled it off an article. It says this, last week, my Facebook feed was full of people posting crazy COVID conspiracy theories, followed by posts about the evidence for the resurrection. I don't think they realize the message they are actually sending. And again, Christ followers, we all feel this, right? Like, I feel this as well, too. I feel this when I hear pastors talking in a certain way. I feel this when I see people in my church or just in general, Christians, you know, whether it's authors or whoever, I, I feel it, right? But of course, we have to say to ourselves, we have to realize that how we betray ourselves, what we say, what we say online, it actually, it, it, it brings dishonor to Jesus. Because guess, I guess, how can we prove to people that we actually believe in a loving, merciful God? How can we talk about graciousness and care and transformation if we ourselves aren't betraying it? If we ourselves aren't saying it, we ourselves aren't living it on our online identities, right? Don't forget, how we live is also how we communicate what we believe. James is talking about the tongue, but it's not just about the tongue for us today. We communicate Jesus, how we live to those who see us, but we also communicate Jesus in the online world as well too. And the reach of what we do has, has vast implications, right? Vast implications. Let me close this morning and let me kind of bring you back to what Jesus is about this as well too, because again, Jesus is quite concerned about this too. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 10 to 11, he says this, then Jesus called to the crowd and come here, come in here. Listen, he said, and try to understand it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You're defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Now, look at verse 12. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you said? Now, I just want to show you something here, right? Jesus is saying, you know what? You're not, you're not defiled, right? Again, he's talking about religious purity. He's talking about the whole idea of sacramental laws. And again, we get that. But he uses this as an opportunity to talk about what comes out of your mouth. And look what he says here. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth, uh, 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 that uh, go out of you onto the internet. You are defiled by your social media presence. You are defiled by how you portray Jesus online. Right? But look at the people who will be offended by what I've just said. Then the disciples came and said, don't you realize that you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Pharisees were these group of believers who were Jewish teachers of the law. And the reason they're offended is because they don't believe they can say anything wrong. They believe that everything that comes out of their mouth is truth. Likewise, Christians who are out there in the world talking about, speaking about, again, all of the things we've talked about already, they perhaps have this, this, this belief that what they're saying is true and that people just need to know. And again, I understand that. But I would say to you that it's better to have a dialogue with somebody face-to-face -face than 
posting it online or, 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 or whatnot, and especially if, if it's not 100% true, right? Again, I forget, I'm not going to put the comments, I'm not going to put some of the examples because where you are right now, you know. Our tongues, our, our, our communications, how we communicate what we are is as important as what we claim to be, right? Marshall McLuhan, the great uh, sociologist and media expert, has this phrase, and you perhaps have heard it. He, he says, the medium is the message, right? What we say, right, what we use to say, what we, what we, how we say something is as important as what we are saying, right? Just, just please hear me on this one, right? How we say something is as important as what we're saying. The medium is the message. We are ambassadors of Jesus, as Paul, as Paul uses in 1 Corinthians, right? We are ambassadors of Jesus. But if all we do is betray Jesus in a way that aligns with our political um, ideologies, our medical ideologies, or, or whatever else there would be, we are absolutely missing the point, and we are bringing disgrace to Jesus. It's not that we shut down our brains, it's not that we accept everything that's out there, but we realize that what we communicate and how we say things has direct implications on, on who we are as Christ followers. And, and I don't know about you, I don't want anything about me to distract from Jesus. I don't want anything about me, about who I am, to distract from Jesus. I, I don't want what I say to somebody, I don't want what I post online. I don't want anything that I do. I just, I'm trying as much as possible. And please hear me. I don't, I don't succeed at that in any stretch of the imagination. Please just ask my wife, right? I don't, but I am aware. And that awareness gives me pause, right? Oftentimes when I'm online, somebody will say something and, oh, I get itchy fingers. I really want to respond. I really want to say something, but guess what? I don't. Because if I don't have a personal relationship, if I'm not going to see them face to face, then it doesn't matter. Right? You're like, well, you should say something. I'm like, no, actually, I don't. Because the last thing the world needs are Christians arguing online. Right? The last thing the world needs is, is a Christian berating, going after another person online. And again, the reasons for it are, 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 are wide and varied. But I'm trying to train myself to realize that whatever I do has implications for those who know me. So if I, if I say something, about, if, I, if I respond in a certain way, People in my church see it. People in my high school see it. People who I haven't even connected with, because Facebook friends are people you just you said yes to for friends, but you haven't seen them in years, perhaps decades, but they'll see it. And really what I want to make sure is that whatever I'm saying, whatever I'm doing online, whatever I'm saying online, is not disconnected with who Jesus is and what he's done in my own life. So yeah, people can say things and, and, and say things about me or, or whatnot, that's fine. Well, it's not fine, but it's to the point where I'm like, okay, I get it. But me coming out as a snarling beast, and again, all the metaphors that James talks, bit and rudder, uh, poison, all, all the things he talks about, I can't pick up those tools and, 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 and think that I can betray Jesus authentically. Right? Our tongues are these gifts that God has given us, but we can't bless God and curse others and think that there's no disconnect there. So this morning, what I really want you to make sure is, again, your online presence, for sure, delete stuff if you have to. But just be aware of how you're living your life in the digital realm. Because again, that is speech. That is our digital tongues. And just make sure that however you're portraying yourself, whatever you're posting, whatever you are responding, that it doesn't bring shame to Jesus. And that takes some discernment. Maybe that's you asking the pastor or just somebody else who's mature in the faith, just like, hey, I was going to say this or going to do this. What do you think, right? And, 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 and if you're ever in doubt, I always just tell my youth this. If you're ever in doubt, don't do it. If there's any doubt in your mind that somebody might, just, just don't do it, right? We need to make sure that we as Christ followers are, are speaking, acting, behaving as authentically to who Jesus is, right? Who, who Jesus is. And in doing so, making sure that we are not bringing disgrace to him, whether it's people we talk to face to face or who we, who we live out on the online presence. Let me just pray for you this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, God, I thank you for my tongue because it gives me the opportunity to speak and to teach and do all these things. But Lord, it also gives me opportunities to hurt and to harm. 
and to bring shame to you as well. I just pray and I ask Holy Spirit that you would give me a tongue of fire, the Holy Spirit in me, changing me, transforming, Lord. And that I pray, God, that each of us would have an awareness of how we are betraying ourselves to a world that desperately needs to see authentic, loving Christians. And God, I pray that you would give us pause in how we speak, whether it's in, in, in person or online, so that we would be not bringing disgrace to you, Lord Jesus. God, realign our inner life with our outer life, our belief with our behavior. And Lord, so too that we would give you praise, honor, and glory, that we would praise you and encourage others as opposed to tearing them down or ripping them apart. Lord, make us authentic disciples of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much.
Before we go today, we want to thank you for your ongoing support of the ministries here at Coburg Alliance Church. If you would like to find out more about becoming a partner, why not head over to our website at the end of the service and click the Give button at the top of the page. And finally, our prayer team is standing by and would love to pray for you. You can click the button or head on over to the website. Maybe God has put something in your heart throughout the service or throughout this week that you would like prayer for. Our prayer team would love to have the opportunity to pray with you and for you. That's all for today's service. We loved having you here with us and we cannot wait to see you next week. Bye for now.